some very simple things can be discussed and the importance of them understood by such a discussion. We have a, an audience here this morning. We have a gathering here this morning. Kind of audience or kind of gathering. It's kind of described by the word audience, meaning you're here to hear. It's interesting to note that it's individual persons that make up the group. And when you deal with becoming a Christian, when you deal with God and His dealing with man relative to man's salvation, then you see group and you see individual. But you know, there couldn't be a group if there wasn't individuals make it up. I want to talk to you this morning about taking personal, or you might say individual, responsibility. If you look throughout the scriptures, you'll see sometimes the word you meaning collective, and you'll see other times it means the individual. One way or the other, when the work of the church is done, individuals are involved because the church is made up of individuals. Those who heard, believed, obeyed the gospel, the Lord's added them to the church. But you have some admonitions that tell us that I can't just say, well, the whole church will do it, and I will not take my own personal responsibility in living the Christian life. That won't work. In Philippians 2, in verse 12, Paul, Paul wrote the church in Philippi. Here's what he said. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now the church in Philippi received that message along with the rest of the letter. And being part of the New Testament of Christ, it applies to us. But it means that the whole can't act without the individuals making up the whole act. So when he says work out your own salvation, that means each one of us must fulfill or discharge our obligations to God. And unless there's an attitude on our part that I personally and individually am responsible to God for what I think, say, and do, and what I don't do, then a lot of things get sort of said, well, it's going to be done anyway whether I'm involved in it or not. But that attitude, that state of mind, that mindset is a wrong attitude to begin with. Fully realizing that God personally loves, cares, and deals individually with each one of us should help us to see that we must learn to take personal responsibility for our faith and our standing before God. Even when you look at the New Testament organization of the church, when you look at one that's fully organized with elders and deacons, evangelists and teachers, and the members, think for a moment. Only the elders can do what God said elders ought to do as elders. doesn't mean a lot that they do, every Christian can do. But they have a certain work that they do that nobody else can do. And we ought to be mindful of that. What about your own family? As a husband, the head of that house, you have an obligation to perform to that house. That family, your family, nobody else can do. The same thing's true of the wife, the mother. Paul would say, love your husband, young ladies. Love your own husband. There's plenty of loving of husbands, but that gets people into trouble in this loose day and age. Love your own husbands. It would be the same thing true of husbands loving their own wives. That's the individual thing. It's personal. So in this sermon, we want to study about why this is important and ways 
in which we are to take personal responsibility. That means I must further develop it, ask why personal? Why personal responsibility? Why is it important? First of all, let's go to the beginning. Moses recording the beginning of things in Genesis 1, verses 26 through 27, tells us that God made each one of us in His image. Certainly, He does not mean physical because God is a spirit. Literally, in John, it doesn't say a spirit. It says He is spirit. He's the eternal spirit. Eternal divine essence that inhabits eternity. There's no place he is not. There's nothing known that he doesn't know. There's no power that he doesn't have. And all those things that we have come from him. But he made us in his image. He made us in his moral likeness. Remember we talk about that sense of oughtness. We see babies abused by even those who should love them, their parents. And we have a horror build up within us. Why is that so? What makes me in such a way is to say that ought not to be. It's because of the way I've been made in the image of God. It has nothing to do with my flesh. It has to do with eternity in my heart, as the Old Testament said. He said eternity in our heart. He's there through the fact that we're made in His image. We learn from Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 9 that He, God, is the Father of our spirits. We get our fleshly body and all such things from our earthly parents. We get our spirits from God. I want to say this again, and I say it as often as I can because I want to impress this upon folks and maybe even cause some people to shake a little bit in their boots, so to speak. But when the procreative act is carried out, and a child is conceived, the moment of that conception, God has created a spirit unlike all other human spirits and placed it in that child. Thus he's a person, or she's a person from conception. God fathered our spirits. Our parents gave us our bodies. That ought to tell people something about the importance of godly families. First of all, godly marriages and godly families. And what it means to rear a child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. By our acts, the procreative act, God creates a being that will never cease to exist. So we need to understand there is that about us that makes us unique, each one of us from the other. We're each personally responsible for ourselves. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, the scripture reads, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Jesus died on the cross for each one of us. Yes, He purchased the church, but remember, individuals make up the church. What individuals? Those who heard and from the heart obeyed the gospel and being baptized in the Christ, and the Lord adds them to the church. Romans 6, 3 and 4, Acts 2, 47. Individually, you respond to the gospel. You could be in an audience that is comprised of thousands hearing one man teach the truth. But if you respond to that gospel in understanding and faith and compliance with the gospel plan, you will do it individually. You will make that decision to do it or not to do it. There's no escaping it. Jesus made each one of us as we are. There is an individual part of us. And we're made in His image. And Christ died then on the cross for each one of us. Well, then we learn why in 2 Corinthians 5.10 that Paul tells us that each one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. You can't escape that. You may try to hide in the crowd, maybe a small crowd, maybe a large crowd. On this earth, you may think you've done so, but God knows. God knows all there is about whatever it is that makes you what you are. 
He knows the secrets. He knows there's nothing hidden from Him. Each one of us then, individually, will receive our own reward. Paul wrote to Timothy saying this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 7 and 8. Notice the personal part of it. For I am ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. All other individuals who are like me and have lived their lives according to the truth. Like I say, a lot of times we look and something happens in the church and we'll say, well, I don't know what they're doing down there. I've never quite understood what's down there. What do they say? I don't know what they're doing up there. But we do that because it divorces us from them. We're all apart. And we must individually choose to be apart. On the day of Pentecost, have all these Jews who are devout Jews gathered out of every nation under heaven there to do what the law said in that feast day. Had no idea they were going to hear what they heard. Witness what they witnessed. But the day of Pentecost came, and Peter with the eleven stood up, and as the Spirit guided them infallibly, we have Peter's sermon recorded. The Old Testament Scriptures are shown to have been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. That his death was forecasted and he did not stay in the grave to see corruption, but that he was raised from the dead to die no more, that he is at that time sitting at the right hand of God ruling. They can see the miracles that are done by the apostles, for they're all speaking in different languages that from their part of the country no one could do that, except it's a miracle. All these other things, the sound that came that sounded like a great hurricane, but there's no wind, came down from heaven and cloven tongues like as a fire set upon each of them. You have every way that God can give proof that what these apostles are preaching is just that. It's the truth. And the scripture says that there were some there with honest and good hearts because verse 37 says, They were pricked in their heart, and they cried unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? But, when he told them as believers to repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is unto you and to your children and all them that be afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. He also tells us there that they are to save themselves from this untoward or crooked generation. Well, God's a Savior ultimately through Jesus Christ. It's his gospel that's the power of God to save, Romans 1.16. How is it they can save themselves? Because they're free moral agents as individuals. They must be determined to receive with meekness the engrafted word, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8.15, 8, and obey it. And they couldn't collectively do that. They did it as individuals. They did receive individually the truth preached to them. And they were baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38 If you look over here in Galatians where he's writing to the churches of that part of the country called Galatia. Notice what he says about members of the church when they go astray. Chapter 6 verse 1. He's speaking to the church because he says, brethren. But then look at what he does. Collectively, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, trespass, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Notice, considering thyself, those who do so, considering thyself lest thou also be tempted. Then notice this. 
Each one of you, there's a responsibility in verse 2 laid upon you. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Then notice verse 3. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man, that's individual, let every man prove his own work. You, you can't do that for me, and I can't do that for you. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Then notice verse 5. For every man shall bear his own burden. You see, in the process of collectively, all of us together, acting under the authority of Christ, individually it's done in my own life. Now that brings us up. Do members of the church really understand this? Everywhere I've ever preached and working with other preachers and knowing them, there's always some in every congregation. They just think it's always going to carry on without their personal involvement. And sometimes the only personal involvement they have is to stir up a stink. Well, have you ever thought about this? If the Lord's work is to be done by the church and it takes personal efforts on the part of each member to do it, and they don't understand that. How is it they understand that they can individually cause trouble? What we do, we do individually in service to God or in rebellion to God. Of course it can involve others. It does involve others to one extent or another. But the point is it's individual. When we sing the invitation song a little bit later, if there's somebody here who is not a Christian and they want to become one, only that person can honestly take the truth, see their responsibility to God in becoming a Christian, and do it. We can sing songs to encourage them. This sermon can encourage them to take on their own personal responsibility and hear the truth and apply it honestly to their lives. We can pray for them. All that. But they must, each one of them, must obey. In 2 Timothy 4, 7-8, through 8, I've already read it to you. There is set out the idea of individuals being rewarded. And I don't want to miss that because I've read it all together. Yes, the whole church will be saved. The faithful of the church will go to heaven. But we'll go individually. Remember that judgment seat of Christ, individually standing there to give an account of the deeds done in my body, whether good or bad. Well, we'll enter into heaven individually. Here's what's interesting that I don't know that we can begin to understand it, and some people don't even try. How can I enjoy heaven to the fullest? Well, I don't know the full answer to that. But I can tell you one answer that's at least partially true. The more you sacrifice here to be obedient to God in thought, word, and action the more you will mold your character to fit heaven. And though others may not enjoy it as much as you, you will enjoy it. In other words, you will enjoy it to the uttermost. What does that mean? You'll enjoy it according to your ability to enjoy it. Does that mean other people there be miserable while you're happy? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It has nothing to do with that. It simply means that that's how individually things can be with God rewarding you according to your works. Remember, we'll be saved in the way the Bible teaches we are saved. But God is a perfectly just God. And He rewards according to our works. And that means works of faithful brethren. Thus He's going to reward us according to our faithful works in the church. Now how involved in the church are you individually? Because he's going to reward you according to how involved you are as an individual Christian in the work of the church. What are we, each individual, responsible before God to do? Very simple. We must know the will of God. Of course, you must believe in Him. But you must know what His will for your life is. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God. Notice, individuals studying to show themselves approved unto God. 
workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Ashamed before whom? Before God. Rightly dividing or handling right the word of truth. We must communicate with God. That is, as to sum it up real quickly, a lot of things said about each one of us praying. But Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. You're in a prayerful mood, state of mind, relationship with God as a faithful Christian all day long every day, ready to pray. It's a regular part of your life. There's no part of your life which you're not ready to pray. Pray without ceasing. I can't do that for you, and you can't do it for me any more than you can study the Bible for me, or I can study it for you. And then, of course, we must decide to follow the will of God, to do the will of God. James 1, verse 22. And people back there had some trouble with this. These are brethren he writes to, and he says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. You think that's applicable today? Are there hearers only in the church? Or do we need this admonition to be ye doers of the word and not hearers only? Because here's what happens if we're hearers only. Oh, that's God's word. It's so important. We need to study it. But for some reason, you know, we're doing, let somebody else do things. Because he says when you do that, when you just hear and don't do, you're deceiving yourself. We mentioned something about deception this morning. How we're obligated not to be deceived. Well, remember, being deceived is believing a lie, not the truth. So we're believing in life. We think we can just hear and fully understand, but yet not put it into practice in our individual lives. Hebrews 5, 9 makes it clear that He's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. We must keep from sinning against God. We have all manner of admonitions about that and all sorts of teaching that teach us how and what we've just said about knowing the will of God and praying and putting into practice the truth that each one of us as individuals must practice. All of that works to keep from sinning against God. But look at 2 Corinthians 10 11. Paul was concerned about that when he wrote the brethren there. He said, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. How many people here would say, I want Satan to get an advantage over me? Well, no, we wouldn't. But by the things we choose, the things we leave undone, the affairs of this life, it says that, well, maybe I am giving in to him. For we are not ignorant of his devices. Can we actually and honestly say we are not ignorant of the way Satan gets me to sin? If you go on through the scriptures, you'll find all sorts of admonitions along this line. James deals with it further in uh, the first chapter of his letter, verses 12 through 16. If we see from the Word of God what we, and I say we, each one of us individually must do, but we walk away and don't do it, Paul says, we're just simply deceiving ourselves, or James does. Because it's like a man looking in a mirror and seeing what a grundle looking fellow he is, and what he needs to straighten up, he needs to shave, etc., etc. But he goeth his own way, forgetteth what manner of man he is. There are multitudes of people like that. They study their Bibles, or at least they hear the truth preached. But maybe they say, well, that applies to so-and-so over here, or that applies to so-and-so over there. But it's never, does that apply to me? We're taught we must be the light of the world, Matthew 5, 16, in our example, in our conduct, in our teaching. That's how we are. It can't be any other way. And if you don't realize your personal responsibility, then uh, you won't be a light of the world. You won't be a pattern for other people to look to and see how the truth is practiced. So each one of us must appreciate the need to take personal responsibility for our love of and faith in God and godly things. Of course, while at the same time remembering that we need our brethren. But individually, I must remember that I need my brethren. And that means all of us individually must remember that we need one another. And thus, admonition after admonition, love the brethren. Well, loving the brethren means I want to see them walking the straight and narrow way. I want to see them using their talents to further their growth spiritually in being like Christ. That involves encouraging one another, Hebrews 3, 12 through 13. Notice, take heed brethren. Well, individuals had to do that. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, that is, while time continues, lest any of you be hardened.
through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, rather than me say, what does that mean about my obligation to you? I ask you, what does that mean about your obligation to me? It's a reciprocal thing, isn't it? Certainly it is. You don't just sit there and watch people absent themselves from the services, the worship periods, or other activities in the church, and just simply let it go. That doesn't have dense anything but neglect. There's a song, I don't, I've forgotten now whether it's in this book, it's the 90 and 9 is in this book. And it comes from Jesus' teaching where a shepherd has 100 sheep. He loses one sheep, that's an individual. And that sheep is so important, he leaves the 90 and 9 to go find the one. I don't think we think that way, especially as American Christians. Because we can have individual sheep jumping the fences and running off, and maybe after a month we say, uh, where has so-and-so been? Well, if you own those goats, sheep, or cows, and they're in your lot, a corral, and you got money in each one of them, you'd know about them every day. Well, what about the flock of God? What about one that jumps the fence? So, take heed, brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. By my individual action as a faithful child of God, by loving my brethren, I can help them not be hardened through deceit. So we're concerned about one another's faithfulness or lack of it. But let me turn around another way. As a member, you know where your faithful brothers and sisters, especially the elders, know that you ought to be at the assembly times. When you know you have to be somewhere else, as long as it's not sinful, isn't it also a wise thing to let them know you won't be here? I remember the time, and it still happens some places, where, where a family sat down at least in the evening, and had a meal together. Let's suppose here, parents, they've got three or four kids. They, it's, it's common for them to always say six o'clock, whatever, sit down and have a meal together. Well, one afternoon, one of them gone. Anybody seen Johnny? No. Pass a bean. Next week or next day, Johnny's not there. Hey, where's Johnny? You wasn't here yesterday. I don't know. That's poor child. And that goes on and on. Where's Johnny? Oh, that wouldn't happen. It happens every day in the Lord's church. We don't leave the 90 and 9 and go find that one because we don't have enough concern for a soul. Oh, you say I'm a very stalwart Christian. Are you? That's a very simple thing. I said in the beginning it's very simple. It's just individual responsibility. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. James 5, 19 and 20. We know we're to assemble one another for the reasons we do, such as this morning on the first day of the week, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. We're taught in verse 24 that we're to provoke one another into love and good works. That means we individually are fulfilling our responsibility to be here as the Bible directs. And in the worship activities, we're provoking one another to be faithful through the coming days. And we're doing that based upon what ought to guide all of us. We all need boosted in this. That's the principle of first things first. Jesus taught in Matthew 6.33. When you consider the assembling of the saints on the first day of the week, and we'll just use that as we are today, do you think that but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things you add unto you has any bearing at all on where you put the assembly of the saints and your duty to your brothers and sisters or to the elders who watch for your soul? soul? Remember, it's not hard. It's an individual thing that says, I am personally converted to Christ. I'm doing all by the authority of Christ that I do because that's the only way I can be faithful. Colossians 3.17, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. We're to pray for one another. Ephesians 
But, you know, when we do pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, that won't take the place of other things that are necessary to keep those folks from falling away. We're to work with one another. Ephesians 4.16, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every plant part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Notice individual responsibility. A constant effort to make sure everybody is what they ought to be in living right. Thus, we're back to what I said a moment ago, as John wrote so much about, in this case, 1 John 3, verse 11, we're to love one another. John just simply says, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We do that individually. It's a love that says, I want to see you living like the Bible says. Why? I want you to be in heaven. And as I do that kind of thing, that means I am saving myself by saving you. In that sense, we do save one another. As Peter said, save yourselves this untoward or crooked generation. In other words, you have to make the decision personally to comply with God's will or God's will can't save you. And you need to ask the question individually, what am I looking for when I go look at a church? When I'm hearing the sermon? When I'm in the Bible class? What am I looking for? Is it just sort of a... I'm shopping around for a new pair of pants or car or dress or something? Are we looking for the truth as it is in the Bible? Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them. Set them apart so you can serve me. Father, sanctify them. Through thy truth, thy word is truth. John 17, 17. And Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. Let me mention this. Where do Bible class teachers come from? They come from individuals that make up that congregation. How do they develop? Out of their personal consecration, dedication, and knowledge of God. And their love for people in the church to teach them the truth, whatever age it is. Why is it so hard to find teachers that are capable? Why is it that people say, just take a step back? One of the things I think where the army or the military forces uh, got this must have been from the army of the Lord. Never volunteered for anything. The Bible talks about being able to teach. You can't teach what you don't know. But you've got to start somewhere. You may not even be a person who's capable of teaching, and you may learn, well, that's just not for me. At least standing up before a class and teaching a Bible class. Questions. That's the only way you teach individually. Let me ask you this. Can you teach your children at home? Certainly. You better. Or how are you going to rear them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? It all comes down to your individual attitude towards sermons like this regarding the growth of the church and keeping the church according to the truth of God as revealed in the Scriptures. What's going to happen in the future? You know, it's funny. I thought about this a while back. But we've been here 29 years. I would be like a Jew and say 30, but I don't want to round it up till I get there because I may not get there. <laughs> some of you, like Buddy and Ken and some others, may remember I said this a long time ago. In fact, the years have passed. The amount of years I use is, is past that. But I said to the audience on more than one occasion right after I came here when I had a chance to preach, if this is still a meeting house for the Lord's church, 25 years from now. What will the people believe that are in here? Well, that's past that 25 years. And what we believe and do is because individuals decided we were going to leave the truth. We were going to study the Bible. We were going to let people run things over us that's contrary to the teaching of Scripture. Do you have that kind of courage placed in Christ through the knowledge of the Word? Do you have that kind of determination? 
Brethren, it comes down to it. You don't have to have every bench here filled. I read a thing the other day, and then the lesson is going to be yours about Alexander Campbell. Most people don't realize this. Of course, he was a brilliant man. And his preaching was tremendous. And if you ever read anything in the early restoration, you ought to read his material. That doesn't mean he's right on everything, but he certainly was a, a fantastic person when you think about the fact that he and a few others, on by just having their Bible, came to the conclusion of the truths that are patterns for the Lord's church. And that little Bethany, Virginia congregation never really was over 30, 40 people, if that many. And he lived there all of his life. He went out to different places. But actually, he, he spent all of his time there in a very secluded spot. And back in those days, there wasn't that many people around. And I think sometimes when I think of Moses having spent 40 years with Pharaoh, but then he had to leave. And where was Moses really developed? It was in his silent years down there, 40 years with Midian, before God ever called him to go back and lead the children of Israel. And that's when he matured. That's when in his silence he grew and developed. He didn't even know what he was capable of doing because remembering at the burning bush, he didn't think he could do what God called him to do. But you know, God knew he could or he wouldn't have called him in the first place. And Campbell, in a lot of ways, like that. And I think of the admonition of the Old Testament, be still and know that I am God. We need some quiet places where we go and pray and meditate and study. And so much of his teaching was at a little church there where half of them be asleep. Some of them didn't realize the kind of man standing before them and what was being imparted to them. They didn't realize it. That's happened so often, it'll happen until the end of time. Remember, even Jesus said when his own people in his own area of Galilee rejected him, he said, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country. Now, is this not Joseph's? Son, well, he can't be somebody great. We've seen him grow up. God does not look at things like that. And individually, you must make up your mind based upon the truth of God's Word that you're going to be all that you can be and you're willing to sacrifice to do it because you love people and you want to teach them the truth. You want to live the truth. You want to stand for the truth. You love the souls of people outside of Christ and you want them to know the truth because someday you'll stand before the judgment bar of God. To give them the count of the deeds done in the body, whether you're good or bad. And there'll be no escaping. Then how shall it be? We have time to change. Life is about changing if you serve God, growing and developing. But regardless of when and where in world history we find ourselves, each person must decide for oneself how to live one's life. Whatever our lot, we must individually put into practice the first thing serves principle we managed, we noticed in Matthew 6, 33, the scripture that's on the wall above my head, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, and the one we started with, wherefore my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's individual, personal examination. And no matter what anybody else does or doesn't do, you're going to do what you know is right as the Bible defines it right. If you're not a Christian, you must individually take what I'm saying and weigh it in your heart. Do you want to be a Christian as you read it in the Scriptures? Do you want your sins forgiven to be reconciled to God? Then you must hear the truth, understand it, believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. The child of God, if you've wandered, you forgot a lot of these things. You're individually wandering. You need to repent, confess those sins, pray God for forgiveness. Above all, you as an individual know whether you're honestly taking in these words or whether you're not. You need to obey the truth. Come while we stand and sing.